It's a cool, cloudy day in London on July 15th, 2017. Garbine Muguruza, the 14th seed at Wimbledon, is placing the finishing touches on a dominant tournament run. She has already powered through six professional tennis players, including the current world number one. The last remaining competitor standing between her and the Wimbledon title is former world number one Venus Williams. Muguruza will go on to win in straight sets, winning set two in a spectacular 6-0. A few months later, she herself would ascend to world number one. The Wimbledon 2017 final is everything you could ever ask for in a sporting match. It's a match that matters, a match which will represent something in the sports history, a match with a narrative arc which feels plagiarized from a direct-to-TV sports movie. 5,217 miles away. It's an arid 111 degree day in Las Vegas. Two men are on a stage surrounded by a couple hundred people at most. They're sitting in tacky chairs playing video games. It's Evo 2017, a fighting game tournament which at the time held the distinction of being roughly analogous to a Grand Slam tournament for Super Smash Bros. Melee. These two men are Plup and Prince Abu, and they are about to play a match so, so unlike the Wimbledon Finals. It's hard to really appreciate this set unless we have a good grasp of its two players. The man on the right is Plup, and his presence on the stage surprises nobody. He is an absolute titan of Super Smash Bros. Melee. Three months before EVO, Plup decided to play Luigi in a major tournament for no real reason at all. He was just bored and thought it would be fun. With Luigi, a character inarguably not even in the top 10 characters in the game, Plup would beat two top 25 players and take a game off Mewtwo King. It was like if someone entered the French Open only serving underhanded and then made it all the way to the semifinals. He is just that much better than everybody else. At this point in EVO 2017, Plup has uneventfully beaten down everyone in his path. His presence on the stage feels like a formality. And the man he is sitting next to is having the run of his goddamn life. But, but dude, I think Melee's fate actually rides on Prince Abu. Really? For the I'm, I'm interested in this theory. For, for the time being. There is so much more to Prince Abu than you might glean from a cursory glance at his ranking and performances. At rank 42, he's a solid player. He's had a mix of good and bad tournament showings, from a brutal 65th at Genesis 4 to a strong 13th at Full Bloom 3. But one very simple thing places an enormous amount of attention on Prince Abu. As of this tournament, there are no other Puff players besides him and Hungrybox in the top 50. Jigglypuff is weirdly antithetical to the things players are usually drawn to in Melee. A slow, zoning, patient character in an otherwise fast-paced, interactive game. As a result, she's not very popular. Just the best player in the United States, and Prince Abu. Since Hungrybox is notorious for refusing practice matches with other players, Prince Abu is the best Puff practice partner in the world. Hungrybox's opponents love Prince Abu, and Prince Abu loves them back. Like a bird hopping around inside a crocodile's mouth, it's a beautiful, absurd harmony. He practices with the absolute best players Melee has to offer in exchange for playing a character nobody else can bring themselves to use. Prince Abu is a fluffer. 
Top players would host fundraisers to fly Prince Abu out to events they were attending, including prestigious invitational tournaments that Abu did not qualify for. They just wanted him there, in the background, to play between matches. There was always this quietly threatening undertone when talking about bringing Prince Abu along to events. It was as if everybody was saying, get Prince Abu to this tournament unless you want a hungry box to win. It's debatable how much of a difference his presence at any given tournament made, but Prince Abu, in a very literal sense, was a critically important person for the top level of the game. To even make it to Plup at EVO, Prince Abu had to upset two higher seeds, longtime Samus veteran Hugs and the world rank 11 player Drug Fox. By all accounts, he's already surpassed expectations. Nobody would fault him if his run ended here. The beginning of Game 1 at first glance isn't much different from any other high-level Fox vs. Puff set. Plup builds a percent lead with lasers, and occasionally mixes in a drifted full hop aerial or poking approach. Prince Abu occasionally wins the mix-up game, and in the first stock hits Plup three times. 11 seconds in, he beats a full hop with a single back air. 23 seconds in, he predicts Plup's movement on the side platform and lands two forward airs. 39 seconds in, he catches Plup's movement to a platform with a single up air. This would be the last time Prince Abu would hit Plup for the entirety of Game 1. In the next 67 seconds, Plup will win neutral 17 times in a row. After two and a half stocks of relentless pummeling, Plup runs in with a jab, followed by a short hop bear. It isn't enough to end the stock. Prince Abu floats back to the stage, and Plup once again runs in with virtually the same jab. Prince Abu, a good player in winner's top 32 at EVO, is prepared this time. He ASDIs the jab and instantly shields. Now, surely an attack following a jab cannot harm him. Plup executes a precise up air which attacks the tiny sliver of Jigglypuff's ear which is not covered by the shield, the Jigglypoke, a technique popularized in a video which came out four days prior by Prince Abu's friend, a top 30 player that goes by KGH. Prince Abu almost seems to see this coming, and tries to angle his shield upwards to protect Jigglypuff's ears, but it doesn't matter, it works anyways. On the mic, Toph, a Fox player, is thrilled to see this implemented. Oh, was that the, was that the jiggly poke? Was that the cut? <laughs> you see Prince up with the player again, he's like, oh no, dude. On the last dock, the final exchange begins with Plup drilling Prince Abu on a side platform. After escaping the drill, Prince Abu once again tries to shield. Please, please do not hurt me any longer. Plup just stands there, well within grab range, staring point blank into Abu's rapidly draining shield. All Prince Abu has to do is press the A button. After an excruciating second, Plup crosses up the shield and grabs Prince Abu right as he cracks and tries to jump away, up throw up airing him to end game one. Between games, Toph offers the following commentary. One. Like, that? Oh. Wow. That was maybe the worst beating I've ever seen on an, on an EVO stream. On a top 48 EVO stream? Like, that was pretty one-sided. He took less damage. That was worse than Songwriter's Axe. Yeah. Of course, Toph is referring to the infamous EVO 2014 set, where Axe wins the final game of a 1-to-1 set in under a minute, a set which has multiple hundreds of thousands of views. Toph compares Game 1 to this iconic moment in Melee history. Plup, unlike Axe, will go on to lose this set.
There is some debate within the Melee community about whether Jigglypuff is the best character in the game. Whether or not she truly is the best is debatable, but one thing is not. If your tag is Plup, you find this matchup to be very, very boring. About this matchup, this can't be too good for Luigi. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think whenever I see a Puff on screen. Like, damn, this is not good for who for whatever, for whatever X character. Too. I would actually I love hate hearing too. your guys' thoughts on. I, on hate too. I despise the characters, so no, I don't want to. All right, I love Welcome it. Welcome to. <laughs> oh, if you, how would you hit Puff with Luigi? He just. Or something works. I don't know. You just you're throwing out random moves. Fireballs. I don't know. You have like your lips on the C stick, just kind of move it. Uh, yeah, I'm really the worst person to true. commentate with for eight No, I actually love. I it. shouldn't I commentate this pool. This is what I. In gone. the good old days, I could complain about Pup as much as I wanted. Hell yeah, you still can. There I'm wasn't. It. No. All right, well he can bring it back with the uh, 30 really good reads. Oh. This is why I don't even like fighting on Yoshi. This is backers in the entire stage. It's rough. Damage. Uh, I have so many, so many words for Puff, but I feel like I shouldn't say any of them. Uh, this balloon is just dominating our game. That's it, I'm yeah. kind of picking Puff. It's the only way. Do it, dude. No, no I'm just kidding. Do you think terrible. you could? It'd be terrible for viewership. Do you think you could? <laughs> you think you could play the character? I can play the character. I can play the month. You can play any character. Yeah, definitely. Oh! I just mean, like, from your heart's perspective. Oh, you, definitely Could not. you do it? It would be... I would never be. No. It'd be That's the hard sellout. I hate myself. I the hard sellout. <laughs> Part of what makes Jigglypuff such a strong character is her ability to make you do something stupid out of desperation to engage. Pair this with the ability to KO at early percents virtually instantly, and you get a character who magically happens to win a lot of high tension situations. He gets that, that could be it. <laughs> Plup is a famously emotive player, and he hates Jigglypuff. For a player capable of beating top 10 players with his 4th best character, it speaks volumes that he hardly ever touches the character himself. And now, in the game immediately following the worst beatdown in EVO history, we begin to see Plup grow visibly tired of sharing the screen with Prince Abu. Without either player having a huge lead, Prince Abu can afford to play defensively. At 648, Plup hits Abu with a stray drill which does 5%. Aside from lasers, he is unable to hit Prince Abu for the next 20 full seconds. Prince Abu is simply always just too far away. Plup, in a departure from his game 1 game plan, begins attempting to run forwards to up smash and grab in neutral. Up smash, up smash, grab, grab, grab. Some of these work, some of these don't. Up smash. Up smash, grab, grab, grab. Up smash, grab, 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 up smash. Then, despite winning up until now, a crack appears. Plup does a standing laser by mistake, which locks you into place. Prince Abu shields the laser, which traps him in shield stun for a few frames. Prince Abu wave dashes forward, but Plup has a few frames of advantage. He can easily roll away and safely maintain his lead. Instead, Plup once again attempts to grab. He is a few frames late. His advantage evaporates. Both players grab on the same frame. Prince Abu is port 1, so the game awards the grab to him. He up throw rests Plup at 14%, instantly killing him to take game 2. Plup hangs his head. He needs to play another game against Jigglypuff. Assuming Stadium was banned, Plup counterpicks Prince Abu to Yoshi's story instead of Final Destination. You'll see players like Mango do this when they feel the smaller space would allow them to play closer to Jigglypuff. Off the bat, Prince Abu wins the first few neutral exchanges, once again enabling him to play defensively. After Abu correctly reads Plup's recovery angle, Abu wipes his hands off his pants, and Plup closes his eyes to collect himself for the next stock. Neither player immediately notices that Plup isn't actually dead.
Prince Abu jumps out to hit Plup, who hasn't moved, and misses. Plup's eyes are still closed. Abu takes the next two stocks with pound to jab reset rest on miss tech, both times ending Plup's stock before 30%. This whole time, Plup has been up smashing and grabbing again and again, and with this manages to get an incredible rally going. Prince Abu misses a critical edge guard, but Plup's running grabs and up smashes eventually cost him too much. Abu back airs him after one final desperate grab and then edge guards him to take the set. The camera pans to the crowd afterwards, and there's so much personality in the frame. A couple people have their hands raised in excitement. More than one person has their hands behind their heads in disbelief of what they just watched. Mango and his coach, Tafikins, look at each other and smile, thrilled that Mango will be able to avoid Plup en route to top eight. Melee tournaments are double elimination, meaning both players were still in the tournament after that match was over. Plup ended up placing 5th after a commendable run through Ryan Ford, Swedish Delight, Axe, and The Moon, before eventually losing to Hungrybox. From 1000 feet, this was a solid performance from Plup, who was the tournament's 6th seed. More to the point, 5th is roughly what people expected Plup would place at this tournament, as he placed 5th at Genesis 4, CEO Dreamland, Dreamhack Austin, and Smash and Splash leading up to this event. In a manner of speaking, his set versus Prince Abu mattered little, if at all, even for his performance within this tournament. This match didn't really have any dramatic implications for Plup's career either, which had been and continued to be impressive. Eight days after the set, Plup would beat Hungrybox twice and route to his first major victory at DreamHack Atlanta. They gave him a trophy, which would fall apart in his hands within minutes of his victory. It's not that Plup was bad against Jigglypuff. In fact, if Game 1 was any indication, he was far and away one of the most elite players against her. There was no broad, meaningful takeaway from the set, no huge paradigm shift before and after. Sometimes, when you play Super Smash Brothers, you just lose. In the same vein, Prince Abu would go on to lose his next two sets after his set with Plup, losing to Mango in a similarly weird nailbiter, followed by a 2 0 loss to Lucky, which appears to be unrecorded. He would ultimately place ninth, tied with a Swedish Foxman, who would go on to win Evo the following year. It was by far Prince Abu's best performance at a melee tournament ever and an impressive achievement for someone juggling med school on top of competing. Plup vs. Prince Abu at EVO 2017 is one of my favorite sets. It's equal parts monumental and meaningless. Timeless, yet utterly forgettable. It tied for 9th on the Melee Stats top upsets of all time, yet the recording of this set has fewer than 750 views at the time of writing, hosted on a channel literally titled Forgotten Fods. To me, this set captures Melee in its unromantic, true self. There's no storyline behind this set because Melee players are not fictional characters. They are just people. Things don't happen according to storylines. Things just happen, and storylines are a superimposed thing we use to make sense of those things that happen. Melee tournaments are, at their core, gatherings of extremely weird people, playing an extremely weird game during which extremely weird things happen constantly. There are dozens of sets which are worthy of being called favorites for people who subscribe to the idea that Melee is scripted, that the players are heroes, villains, or gods. But the most amazing thing about Melee is that it takes place in reality, a niche sub-community of a sub-community with all its mundane weirdness attached to it. And what better a set to encapsulate all of this than the weirdest, most unnoticed set ever played? <laughs>